Right then, everybody, so we're back for round two. We were caught slightly unawares then, and uh, I've just had to leg it down the stairs with Chris. Unfortunately, his youth got the better of me. So, this session we're going to do navigating the challenges of cavity wounds. Now, then, I don't need introductions, do I? I'm Simon Barrett from down the road in Hull, and you all remember that, don't you, from this morning. So, we'll try and get this done in the 45 minutes as well. I suppose the question is, is... Do you have a challenge with cavity wounds? Yes. yes, right, okay. So what we want you to do today, hopefully, is understand the definition, the prevalence, and the cause of cavity wounds. Explore the different presentations of cavity wounds, understand the different components of cavity wounds. And again, it all ties in with the assessment and that holistic approach. I'll explore how cavity wound management has changed over the years, which is relevant to what I was saying about David Leeper. That's why I brought him up, so we'll see how that bit goes as well. Understand the aims of treatment and some practical ways to manage cavity wounds. Right then, what I didn't ask this morning, has anybody been doing this job longer than me or as long as me? You have? Have you? So this lady at the front is older than 46. 88, 86. And I volunteered... Volunteered the year before in 85. I was giving out cups of teas the year before, yeah. Yeah, on an infection control unit. That was an interesting one. So, yeah, so we've been going a long while. If there anybody has not been practicing as long, the reason why I ask is because some of the practices and techniques that we used in the 80s, maybe the 90s, and maybe into the noughties, maybe we're not doing now. Hopefully we're not doing many of them. Does anybody remember, and I'll use the word packing, wounds with usol yeah no anybody with usol and paraffin kathy does thank you anybody with hydrogen peroxide yep yeah. uh, anybody with acetic acid vinegar vinegar really good for vascular wounds we used to put in for pseudomonas put it into the fem pops lay it in ribbon gauze soaked in vinegar the whole ward stunk of chips but we used to use some things in those days gone by that maybe would be challenged in today's practice because <coughs> they were very good antimicrobials. They were very good at killing bacteria, but they came with them some problems. The biggest problem was mainly causing pain. So if you was to put, I don't know if you remember hydrogen peroxide, it used to effervesce and bubble. And so male nurses in them days, we had long white coats and we used to come along with our trolleys, sterile trolleys, and you'd open up your bottle of uh, uh, hydrogen peroxide and it would effervesce and you look like mad professors. And the patients, you must have used to think, Jesus Christ, what's going on there? And then you would get your ribbon gauze, you'd wrap it around your sterile, uh, sterile forceps and with your other forceps that are sterile, you'd start to pack it in, wouldn't you? And you used to have packing competitions. Oh, I got a foot and a half in today. Oh, I got a foot and three quarters to yesterday. And me and my mate, which is interesting because Paul, my mate, it was him that I moved and did me in on the other week I moved him and his missus and his son but we still remain friends which is good so we started out in in the mid 80s the pair of us he's now managing neurosurgery but we have such good laughs reminiscing if you like on some of the things that we did now David Leeper the guy who I pretended to pick out his name David Leeper he did some research into the use of usol because basically what it was was bleach and it was developed in the first world war for trench foot so if you've got trench foot they'll put usol on it now if you were they were being canned in the 80s they used to add paraffin the paraffin stops it drying out so it came out without too much trauma otherwise you had ribbon gauze pulled out like a you know a magician pulling out so what you used to find once you'd packed it down tight which is what they used to say you'd find people clinging to the ceil ceilings like demented cats because they were in that much pain. So hopefully we don't do that now. Um, so that's the next question. Does anybody use any of those products today? No. Well, you'd be interested to know around the country, having asked this question at the JCNs this year, that is not the case around the rest of the country. Some people are still using it under the instruction of certain surgeons, which is a little bit of a worry. Now then, because there are other things that are better that don't cause the same pain, which is the main criteria. Now then, so somebody said in the first presentation, it's about knowing about the dressings. 
And this is a key point sometimes, when you've got an interactive dressing, know how it works. Now then, so, you use, do you use, I suppose, uh, honey? Yes. So just give me a little recap, how does honey work? Pardon? Who's saying that without moving the lips? Put your hand up. Somebody's working here. Was it you, Cathy? Yeah, thank you, Cathy. Cathy is correctly identified and she spoiled me glory there. So we are always informed out with it. It's really good as a debriding agent. It's really good as an antimicrobial. But it says sometimes you get an osmotic draw which causes pain. Yeah. What it doesn't, what the dope say though, is that when it breaks down with oxygen, it creates hydrogen peroxide. <coughs> so the strength of the honey determines potentially the amount of hydrogen peroxide or the antimicrobial effect that you will get. I'm not disputing, by the way, that it's not a very, very good product, but just be aware sometimes of those leaflets. Read all your leaflets that come free in the little boxes and make sure you are familiar with them. I, I have, ju well, last year I was started on some medication for high blood pressure and they started me on umpteen different ones and I said to my wife, I'm not going to read any of these blooming leaflets because I'll start imagining I'm getting all these symptoms. And then I thought, I don't feel so good with certain things. So I made an appointment to go and see the GP. In my wisdom, though, I decided I would self-medicate. And as I thought, I'm a, a nurse prescriber, independent and supplementary, I can sort my blood pressure out myself. So I decided, because Cohen's didn't have sufficient medication to give me at that time, I'll stick to these two antihypertensives. The rest of them I'm going to discard and see if I can get an improvement. So for three and a half weeks, four weeks a day, so if I drop down dead in front of you now, <laughs> my experiment's not worked. But I went to see the GP and she said, you tell me then, what do you want to do? I said, I don't need those statins, I don't need that additional hypertensive drug, and I don't need the aspirin there. So she said, you tell me why. So I said, I can give you all these reasons. You have now given me a one in 100 chance of having these symptoms. And unfortunately, because you've given me four times the different doses, that takes it down to one in 25 or less that I will get these symptoms. So be very, very careful. One, make sure you read the documentation that comes with your medication that you are going to administer to your patients, but don't get too involved with the medication that you're going to take for yourself, because you might get those symptoms, as I did. Funny enough, though, I seem to have got better. But I keep flinching, keep going like that now. <laughs> so cavity wounds can be very challenging. This lady agrees with me. Often need debridement. Do we do sufficient debridement on our wounds on a regular basis? Well, we were just having this conversation upstairs at the break, and my answer is no. It should be part of our wound care plan for our pa patient. The question, I think, is this word debridement, which was highlighted this morning when I said, how many people in this room debride? I think only five people put their hand up, so 5%. The true answer is, if you're practicing wound care then you all debride in one form or, or another whether it's using mechanical in the form of pads cloths whether you've extended your skills and using sharp debridement which i think everybody thinks about whether using hydrotherapy uh, or whether using any other form of therapies that is debriding a wound so we then go on to biofilms biofilms i don't think you're having the session this afternoon on biofilms so i'm going to quickly add that little bit in here do you all know what a biofilm is Biofilm, basically, if I was describing it to you in simple man's terms, because that's what I am really most of the time. Anybody been down to the Eden Project? Yes. Yeah, so the Eden Project is big biodomes, into interconnecting greenhouses, basically, that allow plants to grow in this country, because it's normal, uh, normally a very cold climate. As coming into Donny today, it was, uh, what was it, minus one. So those tropical plants would not be able to survive in these minus temperatures. So they build a big biodome, allows it all, and we can go look at these lovely plants. If you was a vandal, what would you do to kill those plants? Break the enclosure. You'd break the enclosure, you'd let the cold air in, the rain in, and all the plants would go, ooh, I don't like this. Right, so think about this. You've got bacteria, and what they do is create this biodome over the top of them, which is basically the biofilm. Underneath, that allows the bacteria to multiply, and that's when it starts to become a risk as the bacterial uh, loading goes over, and then we start to get infections. So, they're saying, how many wounds, chronic wounds, do you think have a biofilm on them? 
All of them. All of them. Do we all agree? Do we have a 100% consensus? True or false? Uh, it is possibly 100%, possibly. It could be as low as 70%, but the, the evidence would suggest anywhere from 70 to 100% on chronic complex non-healing wounds. Now then, that gives us a challenge because, yeah, biofilms are there, but are they all bad biofilms? No. Not. Y no, they're not. No. Uh, me and you are in tandem, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So not all bad biofilms. Now then, if that's the case then, we can't take the risk in my opinion, but we've got to look at, has that wound been progressing, then all of a sudden it stopped. That's when you prick your ears up and think, hey, what's causing it? It's a chronic wound, have I got some bacterial loading? Right then, what do you do on a day-to-day -day basis as you get up in the morning and before you go to bed at night? Brush your teeth, and you're doing that for what reason? Get rid of a biofilm, is that what you're doing it for? <laughs> I've never heard a dentist say, get rid of your, but hey, use this toothpaste and get rid of your biofilm. <laughs> I always thought it was because she was just cleaning your teeth. <laughs> so you're cleaning your teeth, but you are right. Our teeth have got biofilms on them. Are they bad bacteria? Are they bad biofilms? Potentially, yes. Um, it will cause malodor, won't it, in your mouth as the day goes on. So it's really important that you do it twice a day. Why twice a day? Well, you brush it with fluoride toothpaste, don't you? Fluoride toothpaste is your antimicrobial, and effectively, because your mouth is wet, then it will wash away quicker than a dressing. So nowadays, we've got sustained release dressings, so we don't need to change them once, twice, three times a day, whatever. We maybe only need to change them once or twice a week if we can manage the exudate, which you'll manage the exudate by reducing the bacterial load. Is that the end? Are you off? <laughs> so, um, yeah, think about brushing teeth, what you're trying to achieve, and the same with wounds. So if a wound has got a biofilm, what would you do? You'd clean it, or debride it, or prepare it. Whatever you like to call it, you would need to prepare as part of your wound care plan. You need to start thinking about preparing it for healing. So you will use in your toolbox of dressings or devices, either your pads, your cloths, or whatever's in there to disrupt that biofilm, like you've thrown the brick through the Eden project, you clean it away very carefully, very gently, disrupt it, and then you put your antimicrobial on. You've got a window of opportunity before the biofilm reforms, which will take probably around 24 hours. So it will dampen down that response of the bacteria, and therefore you'll stop that bacterial load, and hopefully then kickstart the wound back into healing. Wound infection, we talked about a little bit this morning about understanding the signs and the symptoms. Exudate management, again, I, I said to you this morning about the peri wound and the wound margins. We've got to make sure we protect them. We've got to make sure we hydrate them. We've got to give the epithelial uh, tissue the chance to get across the granulation. With cavity wounds, it may be a little bit difficult to visualize the whole thing. I think as well, what we've lost the technique of doing we don't palpate and we don't feel the patient as much as we used to do. Get your gloved hand on, and if you've got a wound that there's some undermining, then have a feel as to where it's going. Do, and I, I'm sorry if I'm, if I'm being uh, condescending in this, but do you all understand what undermining is? If you don't, basically, I always refer to it as a mana. So a mana drills a borehole down to the coal or whatever he's drilling for, and then he, and then he starts to man outwards horizontally, doesn't he? So his shaft of coal that he's trying to get is a horizontal man that way. So that's your undermining. See a little hole at the top and then it undermines outwards. So the only way you can really, st you, you need to palpate and, and feel unless you've got a scanners in your eyes, which is an interesting one because people used to say in the old days when biofilms were first talked about, hey, you can see a, bi a biofilm, it's a shiny coating over a wound. Now if I take these off, I can't see you lot, never mind the shiny coating on the wound, but you need x-ray vision, to, uh, sorry, microscopic vision to see a biofilm. And there's a lack of standardised definition, which I slightly touched on this morning as well with regards to cavity wounds. I put that one on just because there's not quite enough food for you all at dinner time. <laughs> so I thought if I can put a few off. But again, I suppose this was bread and butter to me in the day, vascular wounds um, with amputations. Now, unfortunately, unless you've been reperfused, this will deteriorate over time. But I've got this image on for a number of reasons. One, just to uh, talk to you about your dinner, and two, um, about this maceration. So this picks up what I said to you this morning about Louis and diving in. 
there's not a good enough springboard for epithelial tissue to get across and jump into the granulation. Now the image is a little bit blurred from where I am, but it might get better as I get back. I don't know whether you can see, but there's cavities here just going round, and we need to establish where they're going. Now, in my day, whatever that day was, whether it was the 80s, the 90s, the 90s, or now, we, we was told in those days gone by to pack wounds, like I said. Please don't pack wounds, don't pack cavities. Just don't do it. Uh, the reason, for a number of reasons, one is if you pack something in tight, you're gonna cause a pressure point. So if you're nursing that patient and letting it drain out that way, you're gonna be on that pressure point. Two, you're gonna block um, the fluid in, in the dead space, and you're gonna get an increase in bacterial burden. Um, and three, there's a case coming up where you might actually lose some of it. So we need to just lay in and get an intimate contact. What I will say is this, is some foam dressings now claim to conform into two centimetre cavities, which may save you the need for a filler. I'm not, I'm not here to you know, advertise the products. That's not for me. Um, but it may be something you want to consider. Which foam will fill in a cavity without your need for a filler? Now then, so defining. There's no real definition, like I've said, uh, to define cavities as such and what the depth of the cavity is, but we do know that a shallow cavity is anything below two centimetres, which is why maybe that foam was possibly, and I say possibly, developed or came across. Deep wounds that expose underlying structures such as facial tendons and muscles. So again, we've got to determine where it's going from to and what the cause and effect might be. So a wound that exists beneath the dermis is what Timmons and Cooper have said in 2008. Surgical wound dehissing, so a wound that, so a surgical wound if you like, that has broken open, dehissed. Now if it dehisses, it's usually because of bacteria. Most of the cases that we came across, certainly working in vascular, was usually a bacterial problem. And sadly, because there were fem pops, a lot of the fem pops were from groin, obviously down to popliteal region. You, you got contaminations around that area, and so you did get infections. Things have improved since then, though. Uh, so pressure ulcers, we do categorise. We can say quite safely, or can I? If I was to ask you in this room, if I showed you pictures of category one, two, three, four, could you determine wholeheartedly, tell me what they were? I'm going to give you all individual photographs in a minute and ask you to do that. Is that all right? Yeah? You won't find it on that dog and bone, the answer. So, what I'll say to you is this. We can categorise one, two, three, four. We're not always going to be sure, though, 100%. So when we're in Pearl on a Tuesday afternoon, I get lots that are documented as unstageable. If it's unstageable, we'll say unstageable three, four, unstageable two, three, which... I can sometimes see where they're coming from with that. Sometimes I think it's a little bit of sitting on the fence though. We sit on the fence a little bit too much. If you do sit on the fence, all I will say about that is it is a pressure point and you will get a pressure ulcer. So get off the fence and <laughs> make that decision if you can. But yeah, seriously, you know, it is still difficult even though we've got categories. We still find it difficult. I've looked at many that I've looked at with a colleague and they've said it's a two and I've said it's a three and, and vice versa. So it still does happen, unfortunately, so be aware of it. All right. Cavity wounds can exist in any type of wound. I think that's fair to say, whether it's leg ulcers, pressure ulcers, diabetic foot ulcers, whether it's traumatic gunshots, and we've recently had some of them in our organisation as well. Don't know what the world's coming to, do you? People are going around shooting themselves. But uh, abscess drainage and excision. Now then, I was just talking to the founder of a piece of evidence at the break with regards to this excision and drainage. And I always use this piece of evidence in what I've done this year for this presentation with regards to uh, pal and idle sinuses. Right then, so excision and drainage, pal and idle sinuses. Why are we seeing more? Why are we seeing more? People are sat on their bottoms more. If I was to say it's a younger population, why is it specifically them? What is it? Hygiene? Poor hygiene. Gaming. Gaming. I'm thinking gaming and, and a bit of hygiene, yeah. 
it is gaming it is gaming i think that's becoming a massive massive problem so my advice to you if you've got any children of age that would be gaming and i think these days gaming starts i don't know what age it starts but to whatever age it finishes all i would say to you is make sure they get up off their backsides and take some exercise in as well because it is becoming a big big problem now it used to be the the problem of lorry drivers if you like for sat on leather seats or that vinyl seat they used to sweat and they were sat there all the time they'd get the palinadal sinus but now it's the gamers on those plastic leather chairs that they sit on and they get so comfy in them my lad's got one thank god he doesn't get any chance to sit down because he trains um, he's out training five nights a week so he don't get chance to sit down and the only other time he sits down is to revise so poor lad don't know what the meaning of it is it's like he's had this gaming chair for about he must have had it eight years and it looks brand new because he, he don't get the chance to sit down i won't let him <laughs> you're not sitting down Lou. keep moving so several different types of presentation oh sorry i forgot to say and so this is where am i all right to say this kathy before you start getting hidden over there there's a lady at the back who was a tvn in doncaster a few years back and we go back a lot of years kathy refers to me as the tvn that nicks chocolates um i refer to her uh, uh, as the lady with sue that did some research on palinidal sinuses and what they found was basically if am i right in saying this kathy that if you put a silver in as part of your treatment plan after your excision and drainage the evidence would suggest that you will reduce the risk of it reoccurring is that correct thank you so we've got an actual piece of good evidence research and the actual researcher in the room so that's fantastic so after all this year i've been saying the same thing and kathy's with us today so thank you so do they all present like this probably not if they did our job would be a little bit easier we can see where the cavity is where it goes and there's no undermining we can get intimate contact with our fillers and we would gently lay it in and get an intimate contact with those wound edges unfortunately they don't all present like that do they um, it could be as this one demonstrates so we've got a smaller hole the bore hole and then it undermines outwards so we need to find where it goes uh, we've got various things that help us do that what another problem that we have is those that have got pocketing in and again if we don't fill this cavity this could end up with being a dead space here so we gently lay in making sure we fill any dead space the dead space will be the collection or pooling points for that bacteria so you've got to get that intimate contact a sinus or a blind ended tunnel so again we've got a small borehole and then we've got a bigger bulbous area at the bottom and we've always been taught haven't we we must keep it open keep it open let it come out and i would say to you that is still the case gently fill in making sure the exudate can drain out and make sure you tilt the patient onto that side to allow that drainage to come out as well otherwise it will pocket and pull at that bottom you've then got fistulas and those that may be leading from one organ to another or to another area and leading out and again these do become problematic and certainly they tend to occur certainly for me when i did general surgery which was my first ward we used to get a lot of the abdo surgeries with uh, uh, fistulas that were going from a bowel coming outwards and we used to get some rare rare skin breakdowns another thing to be aware of which may not be that familiar to you it says across there i don't know whether you can see it it says bridging so bridging is when you get a real thin do you, do you know the Humber Bridge? Humber Bridge, it was the largest single span suspension bridge in the world. I think, I don't know, China, I think it's got bigger too now. But anyway, when you look at it, if you're ever driving up towards Hull, it looks really taut, doesn't it? It looks skinny and taut, like a piece of stretched epithelial tissue hanging across that river. Now, this is exactly what I mean by bridging. You get an epithelial stretch of tissue that's taut across the top of the skin, uh, top, of, top of the wound from skin to skin. If you're getting that, it's usually a fairly good sign that you've got some bacterial in, uh, burden or an infection going on. So you'll need to use an antimicrobial, but again, it needs wound bed preparation. And I, I, I sort of like we're saying at the break to a number of people, we almost need to get some momentum about behind the wound bed preparation to then kick that as into the way that we allow wounds to heal. What is this? Well, what is this? What is that? What is that? Anatomically, knee. 
anatomically this is a knee so we've got a lady with a knee she was in private uh, hospital and she had a hip replacement hip you think the surgeon may have got a bit disorientated <laughs> so anyway this surgeon this is going back a few years so i think i can freely say this this surgeon in the private hospital said to the private nurses not that I've got anything against private hospitalisation or anything, but I, I just worry about what happened here. He said, <coughs> I want you to pack this wound down tight with proflavin. So the nurse carried out the instruction. Remember though, we are all autonomous practitioners. We are responsible for our actions. So in a court of law, if something went wrong, do you think that surgeon's gonna say, actually it was my idea, my idea. <laughs> no, you're on your own kids. So. <laughs> Make sure you, you challenge if it's not right. So, knee, hip, comes out into the community. It's one of the first jobs I come across, actually, in the community. District nurses rang me up and said, can you come and have a look at this knee injury? So I said, well, yeah. I said, tell me a little bit of history. Oh, she's had a hip replacement. I said, I thought you said, come and look at a knee. She said, oh, yeah, come and look at a knee. So I went down. The hip, the hip was okay. Uh, it still had an open wound with a cavity there but it looked okay, there wasn't any inflammation. I said, show me the knee bit then, they showed me the knee. And there was these two big plugs of devitalized tissue, I think I will describe it as. Well, I thought that's what it was. It looked, al it looked almost like that one on that wound there, but on these two knee joints. So anyway, I thought, oh, a bit dodgy this, a bit dodgy, I'm not so sure what I'm gonna do. So I put a bag of larvae on it, bio bag of larvae on it. Left it three days, came back, made sure it was hydrated, came back. Came back and it sort of like revealed this little bit of a cavity with a white centre. So I thought, oh, what's this? Anyway, I get some forceps and I started. Well, it kept coming and it kept coming. And you remember I said Paul Daniels this morning, or a magician, he just kept coming and coming and coming. I thought, Christ, there's a white rabbit coming out of here as well and a couple of pigeons. But anyway, I got all this ribbon gauze came out and what they'd done, they'd kept packing, kept packing tight. They hadn't removed anything, so they just kept packing. It went right down the femoral bone, creating a fistula that came out of a knee. It got worse. She ended up with a hand quarter amputation. So I would just say to you this, um, make sure, you know, if there's anything that you don't feel is right, challenge it. Challenge it, document it, escalate it. You know, don't let something happen like that. The next one was a gentleman, unfortunately he had a, a brain tumour, but he also had um, metastases in, it, in his bowel as well. And he's tr he, he had the bowel resection, but then it started to track out. And he ended up with his what looked like pressure ulcers on his bottom as well. Um, so again, is it realistic to expect this could heal? Now, if you look at this, <laughs> take aside that bit, this bit, we don't know where it goes, but it looks like it could be healable. Looks like it could be. Now, when you actually palpate around here, this whole thing goes up there where the red demarcation is and comes right the way down there. And you can get your hand in, literally, and get all the way down there. Now, is it healable? Potentially, even with his uh, uh, comorbidities, then it still is possibly healable if he was concordant and if he would agree to. and if he were to go along with the plan. Sadly, he wouldn't. He wouldn't get off that, that position. He had his life to live, whatever was left of it, and he felt he needed to be out. And that is absolutely fine, to be honest. As long as he's got capacity, as long as he's aware, as long as we've done your best interest, as long as, if necessary, you included your VAM, et cetera, et cetera, whatever your process is within your organization, then he should be able to live his life how he wants for however long it is, on the understanding this will not get better. If he chooses, on the other hand, that actually, I want to try and get this better, then if we put all the equipment, all the resources, give the right education, keep him offloaded, uh, and, and stop that pressure point, put the right dressings on, if you like, as the icing of the cake, after we've done that key bit at the beginning, that holistic assessment, we document well, we keep, we keep a continuity plan going, then there is a chance that granulation will come and epithelial contraction will occur. And surprisingly, we nearly got this healed before the poor gent died. And this was another image of a very similar case. And again, we used uh, negative pressure on this one though to close this one. So some 
again, you've got to look in your toolbox and see what is appropriate and what is not appropriate for their environment, whether it be at home, whether it be in hospital, how would they manage, are they on their own, what care package have they got in place? All these things that, if you like, bring, a, bring about that jigsaw puzzle that, that gets us home with Dorothy. And again, oh, that gentleman did go on to complete healing, surprisingly, as well. So principles of wound assessment in general are relevant to cavity wounds the same as they are to any type of wound. It should in, uh, re have a specific review of the cavity, no doubt. Patients should be an integral part. This is the bit that I was saying this morning. We've got to enter into, whether you call it a relationship, a partnership, something at the beginning here that helps us with concordance compliance. We did uh, uh, an audit in 2013-14 and we looked at 5,000 patients in uh, five organisations. And what we found was that at least 30% of those patients were non-concordant. Now, if you think about that in monetary terms, your trust, I don't know, you might have a budget of a million pounds a year. 300,000 pounds is technically being inappropriately used. And then we wonder why we're overspent all the time. Why can't we get things? Because w we've got patients that don't concord why don't the concord? Because I think we go in, are you a district nurse, community nurse? Who's a community nurse? Put your hand up, I'm coming towards you. Right, as a community nurse, I'm not saying you do, but you will find it difficult because of your work pressures and your time to maintain eye contact with me <laughs> for any longer than a few seconds. <laughs> Maybe you won't then. <laughs> <laughs> but, what I'm trying to say is, we go into people, and this is Joe laid in the bed or on the chair or wherever, we almost dare look in their eyes because their eyes might ask a question that leads on to something else. And the task that we're here to do is actually to do, do the leg ulcer. Now then, Joe, how's it going? Oh, your leg's not looking so good today. I don't, no, no, I'm looking down here. How's it going? It's like the wound's going to speak back to you. Trust me, the wounds do speak as well because the wounds will speak to you in the symptoms that they show i.e. an increase in extra day odour, pain, whatever. So the wound will speak to you, but actually Joe just wants you to take a breath, look up at me and see how I'm doing. And I'm still finding within our, any organisation, including our own, that we still miss opportunities. We still miss opportunities to look at the whole skin because we're that focused on one bit. So please remember, we talk about holistic patient, just remember the whole package of the patient where is that wound? That is not my wound. Wow, why do you think that is? It says up there, look, Claire Morris. Yes, <laughs> I think it's an abdomen, but it, it's not a wound of my patient, this one. So, like I say, please include and involve your patient in this assessment. A willingness and agreement or contract if you like, because if you don't get, and I, I worry about this, we've tried it from legal department and all other departments as well within the organisation. If a patient chooses not to go along with the treatment plan, what level of treatment should you provide them? It's very difficult, isn't it? Because we work for the NHS and we're here to provide everything for everyone. Um, and it is very difficult to say to somebody, no. So remember, this is our key bit again, whether it's this wound, whether it's a skin tear, like I said this morning, whether it's a cavity, a pressure ulcer, a leg ulcer, we must do the holistic assessment. We must understand the wound etiology. What is the root cause of it being there? Wounds don't just occur and stay there for the sake of caring. There's something that's stopping that wound potentially from healing. It could be a biofilm, it could be infection, it could be poor circulation, it could be pressure, it could be a combination. But then follow it with a detailed wound assessment. Hopefully you're all using electronic records now which makes it a little bit easier to track. And certainly if you want to audit things, by God, it makes things easier than on a piece of paper going through things. So tissue types, present of volume as well. We've said about that. Again, let's know what the volume is. Let's know what the viscosity is. Is it like a, a clear juice coming out or is it like thick custard? We're talking about dinner time now again, aren't we? We will put you off it. Signs of infection or biofilm. So the signs of infection you can see in the sense of increased of those symptoms that I've already alluded to. The biofilm you can't see, but what I would say is you might get minor versions of the infection and you might get a wound that, like I said, progressed nicely, then stops. How are you gonna kickstart it back into action? 
I think the key is the wound bed preparation, if I'm honest. Condition of the surrounding skin, we mentioned this morning, largest organ on the body, look after it. You've only got one lot of it and uh, we need it. And where's that lady? Was it you this morning? Did you have your mask? Are you winking at me now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm in trouble here. If any <laughs> <laughs> you haven't been planted here, have you? To <laughs> so, so step one, take two photographs. And this, I don't know about you TVNs, if you're still sat in the middle of the, uh, the place, we're doing a lot more virtual work, aren't we? Certainly since COVID, we seem to be doing an awful lot more virtual work. If I'm honest, I still like to be out there and with the patients as much as I possibly can. But because geographically our patch is massive, certainly the Whitby edge, it it's 75 miles and takes me an hour and a half to get up there. But I do like to work, in the first instance, almost to screen the patients, working with the photographs. Now, the best thing or the nicest thing I can ask you is, can you please take one of the wound with a ruled sterile li label uh, and also if you could take one anatomically as well but maintaining the patient's dignity no, no, nothing that we can identify the patient with with a sterile ruled um, label as well and then it gives us something to go at because sometimes you get these close-up shots and all you see literally is like that wound that you just said where is it well where is it nobody can know and that's why to be honest it was there leading on to this so nobody can identify <coughs> where it is and i want you to be aware of it how difficult that can be step two measure or probe with caution in the old days we used to have those metal ones with the hook a duck on the end do you remember and i always used to think god when he was probing into where the fem pop would be you could see the graft and underneath i'm trying to find the cavity and i'm thinking if i hook a duck this i'm going to have a blur on the ceiling here so fortunately we don't use metal probes anymore Beware of causing trauma, discomfort and pain or contamination. So you remember to use your aseptic technique and only use the probes that are provided. Document accurately. You know what the saying is, if it's not done, it's not documented. That's not wholly the case because you will be able to prove it by other means potentially. But if you are on electronic records, please document. You'll never ever get more staff. It's a simple fact, some bad news for you that in 2023 you're not going to get some more staff. So you've got to think, how the hell am I going to work more smartly? Well, the key to that, again, comes back to what I keep banging on about, and I'm sorry if I bang on about it. If you afford yourself the time at the beginning to do a good holistic assessment, then I guarantee, and I do guarantee this, if I don't, if I, if I don't I'll give you my address, um, you can bang on the door and say you're wrong. But I guarantee if we invest the time at the beginning and we make sure that everything is done with our assessments, our documentation, our communication, our escalation, and we afford ourselves X amount of time to do that, you will get a patient that will progress or manage their symptoms, whatever the desired outcome was, because you might not be trying to heal quicker, better, sooner, more cost effectively. And that takes us back to that question, what does the TVN have more than us? Well, it might be that they have a little bit more expertise, but an expert is a, what is it? X is a has-been and a spare is a drop of water. So if I'm an expert, I'm an has-been and who's a drip of water, which isn't a good description, hopefully. So it might go against us. I'm going to ask you a question. Right, district nurses, if a patient, you go out on a first contact, how long do you have for that first contact? How long do you afford yourself? How long? An hour, anybody want to raise that or lower it? 90 minutes. Right, where do you wear? Scarborough? Down south, what, you want holiday up here? <laughs> so you're from down south and you afford yourself 90 minutes. Us northerners, the best you're offering yourselves is it 60 minutes? Less? Right. I will say to you, TVNs, how long do you afford yourselves? An hour and a what? Right. Do you think an hour is long enough? No, I don't either. So the answer to this is we all move down to Devon, where this other lady's from, because <laughs> she affords herself an hour and 30 minutes. So if we can quickly pack things up after this, we're all coming back on the bus, we owe. Hour and a half is about right.
that is about the minimum for your first contact, first planned contact to do a good holistic assessment, document it and everything else. So that's what you need to be thinking of, ladies and gents, is an hour and a half. Can you afford yourself that? If you can, then we're going to be very much task driven, going in, going in, going in and keep repeating ourselves. So regular shape ca uh, cavity, you might be able to get away with using a ruler that's disposable and obviously please dispose of it, don't reuse it. Cavity with undermining, palpate like I said and use a probe to see where it's going. Cavity with a tunnel, you probably need to use a probe. A sinus, it'll be a probe and or x-rays and or scan. There may be an example of the probes that are using and maybe that one to your right would be a, an over exaggeration of a bridging across a cavity. But quite honestly, that is a cavity with a very big piece of bridging. My visual impact of a bridging was more like epithelial tissue that's very tightly stretched, not quite in that format. You would also think on the one on the left hand side, you've got quite a full wound there of dead and devitalized tissue, an old clot. But in actual fact, this still undermines, and I can remember this particular case, as this whole skin was moving around, all the tissue had detached underneath and it wasn't very healthy at all. It really was a long job to heal that one. The one to the sacrum, again, if you remove the pressure and take away the root cause, make sure they're hydrated, make sure they're fed appropriately with the right proteins going in. If you look at the surrounding skin, for somebody who's fairly elderly, the rest of the surrounding skin is quite healthy, isn't it? So we will get a good outcome with just a bit of common sense intervention. So fistula will need a fistula gram, cavity will measure consistent place using a probe. Remember the clot face if you can, which will come in a minute. Good documentation is vital, we've said. Consistent approach to measurement is vital. Accurately describe the wound, yes. Please describe it. I don't know how, what tools you use locally, but I always used to use applied wound management. Now, that, that was excellent going back the years. Things have changed and things have moved on. People are using different tools. Maybe it'd be really nice if we all use the same tool. Two photographs, as we've mentioned, use the clock face. 12 o'clock is the patient's head. So when you're describing that wound, just remember 12 o'clock patient's head and everything that comes aside from that, that's where you're going around the clock. A cavity wound should heal from the base upwards, Joy Tickle says, 2020. Yes, it should, but it needs also epithelial contraction to come across that granulation. Reduction in length and width will not be seen initially. Well, I would challenge that, depending on the age of the wound and the complexity of the wound, I would expect, if I get a new wound, and it is new, I don't mean new to me, a new patient wound, I would expect a trajectory of healing of about 40% within the first two weeks for, to know that it's going to kick on to complete healing. If it doesn't, then you, you need to be pricking your ears up at that two week stage and thinking, hey up, I'm going to be left with a bit of a chronic wound if I don't reassess reevaluate and decide what I need to do next for this patient. Devitalised tissue may obscure full obs assessment, but it also may uh, delay the wound healing. So this is when it ties in again, quite critically, making sure that we need to do good wound bed preparation, clean or debridement or whatever you call it. A full assessment, not possible immediate. Document this and perform. Again, I don't want that though to be used as a, a get out of jail, sit on the fence like the pressure ulcer thing we were saying earlier. Don't just say, I didn't have time today. I'm going to go back. I'm going to do my risk assessments. I'm going to do et cetera, et cetera, unless you can justify it. If you do justify it and you document that, that will stand up in a court of law as long as you can justify it. Cavity wounds are associated with high risk of infection. That's because of that dead space that I mentioned. So remember dead space, intimate contact with the filler. A large wound of volume of exudate can be produced. Yes, it can. So again, we need to make sure that we're going to manage that exudate and the peri-wound skin We've said it a couple of times already, vitally important that we look after it to get that springboard, if you like, to get in. So the management of complex, challenging cavity wounds may require skills and knowledge of the specialist clinicians, uh, which it might. So remember, there will be your tissue viability team. There will be possibly pathways that you refer through. Historically, we've always said was to pack a wound. Please don't pack wounds. Uh, tight, it's just not appropriate, it's gently laying or loosely fill, but not tightly packed. Hey, did that just refer to you then, Cathy? No, it's been, it was Sue, wasn't it? Uh, wound debridement where applicable. So again, if you've extended your skills and you are confident, competent and assessed as safe, 
with a blade, then your blade is an option. I save my time fitting carpets and I'm excellent with a Stanley knife. So absorb and control exudate while allowing free drainage. So that goes back to what I said. Always remember if you've got a cavity, tilt the patient onto the cavity as well to allow it to drain. Pain-free application and removal goes back to what we were saying with the skin tears this morning. It doesn't matter what type of wound it is, we need to be working with the patient. If they have a bad experience or a bad memory, they're going to say, oh, you're not doing that, you're not doing it. So please use the appropriate products. Sometimes it's invest to save. A little bit more at the beginning in time and money with the right products will get you the better outcome. So don't just go for cheap and cheerful on your, on your formulary. Prevention of infection and also any other considerations that may delay it. So this is just one that's uh, been trepped with the product. Now the product that this has been sponsored by is Monica and the product is Exifiber. And this is just say, showing that as a picture. I'm not so sure how good it looks at the back. But we've got some dead and devitalised tissue. They've put the product on, it starts to clean. And then it starts to clean and close. Because we're managing the exudate, we're managing the wound bed while preparing it. And we're also addressing any other underlying problems like edema in the limb. So don't just think that dressings on their own will do it. They will be part of your plan. It may be as per the first presentation this morning with the ladies that you may need to have an addition of compression in there as well. So the ability of the primary wound dressing is to conform to the wound bed. Very important so it doesn't pull. Gelling fibre dressings would be ideal. Exi fibre as produced by Monica, which I've just mentioned. What I will say to you is, if you want to see the product in action, which there's a, a little indication of it over there, please use the stands up there. But again, please use all the stands up there. It's your time, your stands, your resources. They conform to the contours of the wound bed. Very quickly, I'm going to go on to this. So what does Exi fibre do? transfers exudate efficiently and effectively into the secondary dressing, which is good, so it stops the maceration, stops excoriation. One piece removal, no fiber shed, fantastic. Pro promotes autolytic debridement, so that's one of the forms of, of debridement that we have access to, that we do without any specialist skills. It does come with the addition of AG if you require it. If you've cleaned and prepared and you've done your biofilm cleanser, we've got some AG in there. It's proven in practice, it's uh, got underpinning by clinical evidence and it supports cost effective uh, dressing selection. Please though remember the only way you're cost effective is if you are effective with your assessment because you will make the right decisions. I'm going to flick through that one. So think outside of the box sometimes. Sometimes it might not be a dressing, sometimes it might be a device, it might be something like your negative pressure or it might be something as similar, uh, s simple as a stoma bag. But again, remember there are options for you and to you. But just please remember that surrounding skin is vital that we look after. So, in conclusion, cavity wounds, as going back to the first question at the beginning of this, can be quite challenging, but I don't believe they have to be quite as challenging as we sometimes think they are. We ut need to utilise members of the multidisciplinary team don't try to work in isolation. It's much, much better if we do work in a team, whether it's podiatry, whether it's OT, physios, whoever. Certainly the podiatrists and the diabetic foot lesions or the lower limb, it depends on what your pathway is, then they are an excellent resource for us. Good documentation and accurate descriptions, vital. So if you've got a tool that you can use that's employed within your electronic records or your paper written records, Please use them because every bit of evidence counts. Successful management will lead to reduced pain and improved quality of life. Also, it gets better improved healing rates because of that concordance. Effective management leads to better healing outcomes. Sure enough, it does. And challenge healthcare professionals who want to implement outdated cavity wound management. So remember what we showed you, that image. Um, with regards to that filling down to the knee. Some things don't always go right, so remember you are here as autonomous practitioners to challenge. So that completes me for that session. Are there any questions or has that fulfilled your cavity wound needs? <laughs> <laughs> I will say thank you very much then everybody and I may see you next year or not. See you soon. Thank you.